<clears throat> Hello. Uh, now we'll talk uh, about um, uh, Hermann Herzberger, a, a very important uh, Dutch architect uh, who himself uh, was born on July 6, and today is July 6. So we wish him happy birthday. He's actually 91 years old today. Uh, so Hermann Herzberger is one of the most famous Dutch architects Professor Emeritus and the last Dutch architect to receive the prestigious Royal Gold Medal. Herzberger is one of the oldest active Dutch architects. Uh, here he was when he was younger and um, here he is now, maybe close to this age, still vigorous and uh, obviously looking at some uh, architectural project. I mean, Maybe not obviously, but I think this is the case. Hermann Herzberger. He said this, and I think we should talk about this. He said, the origin of architecture is in the public. Very, very interesting statement. And I'm not sure it's quite like this, but I do think that the public dimension is very important indeed to architecture. Res publica, unless privata. But you also need you have the public, but I also think you have the, you know, the, the private matter, the individual. Uh, but he says the origin of architecture is in the public. And his architecture, his built works do exemplify this uh, statement. For him, indeed, the public dimension of architecture is very, very important. Actually, I. I don't, I don't think I have in this presentation uh, a project by him for, let's say, a private house, although he most surely did build. Some drawings of Hermann Herzberger. He uses uh, a strict uh, geometry, not always, but most of the time he uses the grid, but he also being, uh, you know, uh, a countryman of, uh, uh, well, uh, being, uh, yeah, uh, a countryman of the same country to, to which um, uh, Johann Huizinko belonged, the one who wrote Homo Ludens, you can see a certain playfulness here as well. Even if he operates with the squares and with the grid, there is a there is a playfulness which brings in some instability. And that instability is very important because that instability um, uh, creates uh, uh, a dynamic uh, space for uh, interactions, for negotiations between indiv individuals who compose the so-called public, which to him, as we just uh, found out, was and is very, very important. Uh, so now I only show some drawings, but even in the drawings, the public dimension of architecture uh, is reflected uh, rather explicitly. But if you see in this drawing, and he built this building, uh, you have you have the D1, meaning the whole, but you also have the fragments, the multiplicity. So you have unity and multiplicity. You have the individual, you have the sum of individuals that compose a whole. And I think this is important. You don't have just a monolith, a whole within which you don't recognize the fragment or the individual. You recognize the individual, but you also notice the whole. So you have, as I said, varied in unity or multiplicity in unity. And this is very uh, symptomatic for his architecture in, 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 in many projects that he did and does. And he did build a lot.
there is a certain serialism, meaning, you know, there is a, some kind of a, a structuralism that he belongs to, but he's able, because of homo ludens, to uh, bring some, uh, uh, you know, uh, movements or some dynamic quality which uh, uh, destabilizes a little bit the system. And uh, thus, freedom is not far away. You see clearly here, you know, he has this, uh, you know, conglomerate of, of squares that uh, connect. But there is also, but I, I would say that in his architecture, the balance between uh, l'esprit de geometry, the spirit of um, geometry, and the spirit of finesse or fineness, as uh, Boileau told us, uh, is, in my opinion, a little bit in the favor of the spirit of geometry. Ideally, they should be uh, equally, uh, uh, they should have equal, uh, equal uh, uh, weight, the spirit of geometry and l'esprit de geometry and l'esprit de finesse, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of fineness. In, in his work, they are almost equal, but I think a little bit of balance in the balance is in the favor of geometry. Montessori School in Delft, 1960-1966, so let's read a little bit about it. This school, designed in 1960 and extended several times since, has a spatial articulation that permits activities to take place simultaneously without one disturbing the other. The classrooms, which are L-shaped so as to articulate different zones of concentration, together generate a complementary wide central corridor which meanders diagonally through the building. Much attention has also been given to the external zone and the entrances, creating spaces which can be used in many ways. Every effort has been made to soften the threshold between the outside world and the school. The playground is not closed off and can be used by local children after school hours. So, you know, just from this description, we see the Hermann, that Hermann Herzberger liked those zones called in-between. The in-betweenness that uh, very often important architects are very concerned with. In-betweenness. In between the private and the public. In between the, the exterior and the interior. Interstitial spaces. He is a very rigorous architect. You can see that he builds very well very convincingly, the tectonics are clearly um, served. Uh, and um, yet, yet, because he knows how to manipulate geometry in, um, with a certain degree of uh, uh, freedom or playfulness, uh, the geometry is not very rigid in the end. Although at the beginning, perhaps, it is. You wonder how children uh, learn to be in such a school, a school which promotes openness. Let's compare this openness with uh, a school where you know the classrooms are in closed spaces, where there is a, a closed door, uh, and, and and there is no fluidity of space like it is here. These children grow up in a in a in an environment which encourages them. Um, towards uh, dialogue, towards debating uh, ideas, uh, to sh uh, uh, climate of sharing. And as you can see, how many children do this sort of play? No, it's about playing within the school. Um, yeah, it, it does matter. It does matter when these children are encouraged to be not afraid, are encouraged to be playful, are encouraged to be creative and to, to be open towards each other, they develop into uh, citizens of, 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 of the country and of the world who are, uh, you know, uh, in a healthy way, prepared to assume the, you know, the, uh, not the rigors, the, the functions of social life. 
but the building is built uh, you know look even here it's 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 um, it's a it's a strict architecture but it goes beyond strictness it goes beyond uh, um, you know uh, rigidity because because it is animated in essence by what he believed in that the public is the origin of architecture meaning dialogue interaction uh, even these chairs here you know let's call them chairs they remind me of the of the wooden boxes in le cabanon by le corbusier not really the most comfortable chairs but uh, you know still be uh, you know offering the the chance to sit on playfulness within the school yes as it should be you look at these children they they, they the, there are cubes the the structure of the building is is based on the cube but because he problematizes the 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 grid through uh, a certain degree of freedom the children are you know uh, enjoying this as as it's obviously here obviously uh, uh, seen here and we see i guess uh, you know some kind of a I don't know, development of the school from 1960 to 1968. This was also the uh, period in time that, that was animated by uh, social activists, political engagement, militantism, you know, the famous 1960s. So I think people at that time um, understood more perhaps than uh, at other times the value of social interaction and engagement with society and even with political methods, fighting against the war, fighting against the banks, fighting against the, the obsession with money. Uh, maybe that kind of idealism should come back. Daigun Experimental Housing in Delft, 1967-1970, again, the same period, no, at the end of the 60s. So the idea determining, determining the uh, carcass houses, uh, a prototype, uh, uh, no, six, eight prototypes of which have been built in Delft is that they, they are in principle incomplete. You see, again, although he uses the grid very rigorously, he is not afraid of incompleteness. Contrarily, he promotes it. The plan is to a certain extent indefinite. So that's what I was trying to say when I mentioned l'esprit de geometry, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of fineness. The spirit of fineness uh, initiates uh, the, the open-ended uh, uh, quality, the indefinite. So uh, the plan is to a certain extent indefinite so that the occupants themselves will be able to decide how to divide the space and to live in it where they will sleep and where they will eat. If the composition of the family changes, the house can be adjusted and to a certain extent enlarged. What has been designed should be seen as an incomplete framework. The skeleton is a half product which everyone can complete according to his own needs. The house consists basically of two fixed cores with several different half story high levels constituting the living units which can accommodate a variety of functions, living, sleeping, study, play, relaxing, dining, etc. In each unit, um, level uh, part can be partitioned off to make a room, the remaining area forming an indoor balcony running along the entire living hall or void. These balconies, which can be furnished according to the tastes of the individual members of the family, together constitute the living area for occupants. There is no strict division between living area and sleeping area with the imposition of going upstairs. Each member of the family has his own room as part of the large communal living space. This is very interesting because I thought of, of, of it. Why is it that we call only one room living room as if the other rooms are not for living this plan represents an attempt to get away from a number of persistent stereotypes which still dominate housing today well here we have a creative architect and creativity 
fights against stereotypes. So the, the creative architect does the same thing. And uh, Herzberger was and is a creative architect. Again, the end of the 60s, an architecture which is uh, uh, which offer a, a resolute frame, but within the frame there are various degrees of freedom, and allows for individual choices. As we read, you know there are no uh, strict uh, divisions here. He pre provided the, the incompleteness of a frame, which allowed for the participation of the inhabitants to uh, model to craft their interior space according to their specific needs. So to put it uh, another way, this is an architecture where there is some kind of a balance between order and disorder, between what is definite and what is indefinite, between what is complete and what is incomplete, because he provided the complete frame, but within the frame, the incompleteness or the dynamic life asserts itself in unexpected ways. Order and disorder. Some offices, 1968-1972. You could say here there is a certain amount of rigidity because the grid is very strict and obvious. But if you look at one fragment, let's say just one uh, unit here, one module, because it is a module, this almost reminds uh, one of, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was a famous house built in, in Japan. Um, I forgot exactly how it was called. You see the corners are free in the sense that, uh, you know, the supports for each module are in the middle of the, of the module and uh, the corners are rather free. You can enter through the corners and then uh, on the superior level, there is glass. So within one module, the module is not rigid in itself. There is a repetition of these modules, yes, but because the, the unit has a certain degree of freedom within, the whole complex somehow uh, doesn't uh, fall into, uh, you know, uh, uh, something very static or, uh, you know, something very dogmatic, very rigid. So let's read a little bit. An office building as workspace for 1,000 people designed as a single articulated unit consisting of 60 tower-like tower cubes. Well, they are not really towers, but connected on each floor by overpasses. The extensive central street area in which the space is equally developed in vertical and horizontal direction calls to mind the street pattern of a medieval town. Now, when we looked at the, the, that picture, that image, we, we, normally we would not uh, think of the medieval times, but uh, let, let's, let's, uh, let's contemplate uh, further this uh, building. Also, the materials of the glass roof inner space evoke an outdoor atmosphere. In each corner, there is a place to have coffee, to relax or to hold meetings. The illumination throughout is an integral part of the architecture, in this case conceived in terms of street lighting. The transparency, transparency and lightness of the metal stairs, together with the glass brick fillings, create a harmonious contrast with the heavily dimensioned main structure of the building. We try to arrive at a wealth of formal expression by using simple, sober means to create a feeling of spaciousness, even when working on a small, small scale. 
So images from uh, from this um, uh, building, or should we say, uh, this uh, uh, architectonic organism composed of, of many units that come together. So again, you have unity and you have multiplicity, uh, both horizontally and vertically, as you can see here. And in this picture, we actually see a confirmation of the fact that what he said he meant, that is the public is the origin of architecture. What else do we see here? Continuous interactions between, between people. So is this public dimension which animates Hermann Herzberger's architecture at its very core? the togetherness of, of people. So who wouldn't work with some pleasure in, in such an office? You are, you have your own individual desk, your own telephone, but you also have communication across the space with other, uh, you know, other people, other spaces, other functions. So again, the, the, the public dimension of architecture, I think he was right, is very important. Interactions, dialogue, eating, working, maybe even playing. It's possible they have some way even a ping pong table, I like to think. Otherwise, uh, structurally speaking, the building is very rigorous. You, you wouldn't expect this, uh, openness that happens inside, indoors, from uh, even contemplating the plans or the axonometric drawings or the sections. But you see actually, even here in this fragment of the plan that, that he was uh, working in the direction of, uh, of um, you know, communication, interaction, dialogue. Yes, he worked with a square. But you see, there are variations of this square. And so he is playful with the cube, very much so. A music center in Utrecht, 1973-1978. Uh, it's just a second, please. Oh, no, I cannot move this. It's... Rather than trying to distinguish itself as a temple of music, the building situated on a market square seeks to be absorbed by the city informally as an integral part of it. So again, he was against building a temple of music. The music center is accessible from the surrounding shopping arcade. The intimate dim dimensions refer to 19th century Parisian arcades or arcade. We do not derive the forms from the past, but rather the articulation and atmosphere. Columns occur in many lengths, but with their cap capital-like heads, they constitute a formed family helping to establish an architectural order throughout the building. There is relatively little differentiation in the materials used inside and outside, their finish and proportions, except that the walls of the foyer are finished with wood, especially designed well tapestry, tapestry. So wood and tapestries, that is the softness uh, of, uh, of what the wood is and the softness of what tap the tapestry was, uh, is. And, and the, this softness, I think, is, is uh, connected to that uh, spirit of fineness, which balances the spirit of geometry. The main concert hall is designed to accommodate a variety of uses. The idea that a good view contributes to good listening gave rise to the amphitheater form, while the configuration in the round not only brings players and the audience closer, which is of high concern to him, to bring the players and the audience closer, but keeps the distance between speaker and listener to a minimum. Again, it's about bringing together, only connect as uh, Vincent Scully uh, wrote, uh, quoting uh, from a British uh, writer. 
roster. The fires, the fires are fairly minimal too, as a result of overcramped building lines, but have a wealth of places and on offer. These range from introverted corners where one can withdraw from the crowd and places where one has an overall view of things to others giving you a glimpse into the auditorium or of the town outside. And this is the building. In a way, both closed, defined, formed, and unformed, indefinite. Uh, you know, it's a huge space for, uh, you know, concerts, but uh, you can tell that the architect was very, very concerned with crossing the frontier between I and zoo, as Martin Buber would say. In other words, was very concerned with bring, bringing people together as much as possible without having them lose their own individuality. I mean, even here, you know, it's a concert. It's a concert hall. You have adults, you have children running. You know, this is not what one would easily expect, you know, you know, in a large urban concert hall. Uh, children uh, running around, but they are stimulated by the openness of the space, by by what the architect uh, uh, promoted. And other functions here as well. Uh, you can tell again that this is an open society, very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, willing uh, to, uh, you know, cross frontiers and to, 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 uh, to communicate the Dutch. And look at these balconies also, you know, there is, there is, a, uh, uh, there is no dogma, there is no inhibition. It's, it's really about a social phenomenon that flourishes. And there are these, you know, you see the musicians, you know, interacting with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the public. So the frontier between the public and, uh, you know, the performers is uh, almost erased. Very nice. Maybe the octagon is also auspicious for, uh, you know, um, a certain complexity of uh, activities. We see that the large space is, uh, is actually an, an, an octagon and the octagon has a, a reputation for being a geometrical figure that uh, perhaps we should employ more often. Actually, even Bjarke Ingels employed it in a recent uh, site plan in Saudi Arabia, an oct octagonal island. Look how many variations here on the, just on the issue of the color. You know, again, this man through geometry was searching actually for freedom and variety. Montessori School and Willems Park School in Amsterdam, 1980-1983, we saw another Montessori School. Uh, both schools resulted from the same brief as assigned by the government, and as they were developed from principles as identical twins, they also show great similarities. The very limited building site, beautifully situated in a spacious green area, inspired to make villa-style buildings thus from an urban pl planning point of view, matching the adjacent large detached houses. Also the interior of both schools fits to the image of a large house with the classrooms grouped around the large hall space opening up to the heart of the school, the central place for all events that egress out of the separate classrooms. Gabriel Gatehouse in 2017 reported for the BBC from the Netherlands, where he grew up. Anyway, these are the two buildings. They make me think a little bit of the architecture of Fumihiko Maki in Japan.
The interior again shows the breaking down of the walls, of separating uh, entities. I mean, there are separations, but there are also penetrations of these separations. So you have, um, you know, maybe expressed through some kind of a linguistic uh, exasperation, the solitary aspect of architecture and the solidary aspect. It's, it's, it's both uh, uh, it's both an architecture that frames, that encloses, but it's also an architecture that opens up, that is solidary. And the solidarity of the spaces has as an effect the solidarity of people, I like to think. Uh, both horizontally and vertically, and also through the sloping uh, planes of, uh, you know, uh, uh, stairs and all this um, approximated amphitheater configuration, which is very conducive to um, bringing together a possible performer and the pass possible audience. That is to, uh, to dialogue. And look at the children. They left their shoes there and they play chess. I mean, you know, again, an open space creates open citizens. They are not yet maybe mature citizens, but you can tell from the way they play, they have a very open attitude towards interacting with each other. They are not inhibited and they are not inhibiting. Freedom. Freedom and structure together. Bravo to Hermann Herzberger. I wish more schools were like this. I can only envy these, and I'm glad for them. I can only envy these young, young, uh, young, young people, these children, you know, uh, being taught in such a school. And playfulness is, is very much part of what they do. And it has to be. Look at them. They are playful. They are not afraid to play. The whole building promotes openness, dialogue, taking risks, playing. And the octagon again here. Otherwise, you could say this is a almost rigid architecture, but it's just a frame. And within the frame, a variety of activities take place. Some thought of, others unexpected. When he said that the public is the beginning of architecture or at the core of architecture, he actually meant dialogue, breaking down the frontiers, breaking the box. In essence, you break the box when you achieve a public dimension in your architecture. And that public dimension is very, very important indeed, because it's about dialogue. It's about uh, communication. It's about not being alone. It's about togetherness. And again, we see variety in unity, multiplicity in unity. How many configurations here for so-called details? But as it was said, in architecture, there are no details. In the sense that everything be belongs to everything else. Ministry of Social Welfare and Employment in The Hague, 1979-1919, the of this office building for over 2,000 people is organized into individual spaces for nearly, nearly everyone. The building structure consists of repeating units, thereby avoiding the endless corridors that occur in so many office blocks. On the side facing the railway embankment, the office spaces would best be situated high up so as to have a view over the embankment. On the other side, the building has been kept as low as possible to conform to the height of the housing in this area. Instead of an architectural volume containing vast office spaces, we opted, this is the statement of the architect or the architects, we opted for an articulation into different building sections 
so that the volume is that it, as it were, distributed over a number of separate buildings grouped along the elongated central area, a number of smaller office buildings together constituting a whole. Again, it's about uh, variety in unity, multiplicity in unity. Each of these more or less self-contained office buildings can accommodate one or more departments, each being individually accessible from the central area. All these departments or combinations of departments are arranged as autonomous, autonomous units about a glass-covered vertical space that extends over three floors. The vertical spaces are to be situated along one of the exterior facades in such a way that all workspaces have an unobstructed view to the outside. Again, it's about communication. Now, it's true that uh, despite the uh, you know, rotation of these uh, prisms, there is, uh, in essence, a certain uh, rigidity. The system is, um, is uh, clearly uh, present, maybe too clearly and maybe too much in this case. But it's possible, like in other works by Hermann Herzberger, at the interior, there is a, a, a fluidity of space and the functions beyond geometry. And it is, as you can see. At the inside, there are these corridors, these uh, internal streets, if you want, where people can stop, can have a chat, can dialogue, can comment, can... Uh, have a professional discussion, whatever. And the space communicates horizontally and vertically as well. There is more freedom inside than outside. His buildings towards the outside do not totally give justice to the complexity of, uh, of um, you know, spatial configurations um, that uh, do happen at the interior of the building. And uh, the octagon insinuates itself again. And again, the column, which for him is an architectural event, and he studies this architectural event as carefully as possible. Even the presence of the capital, which some, you know, many architects today avoid to address, he didn't. He felt the need for it. Community center, and maybe the very first word is so telling, community, 2009-2012, the community center, uh, the veteran, I am not sure I pronounce well, sorry, consists of the former Dr. Voskul within a new annex, the users and representatives of the neighborhood platform were closely involved in the design. So participation. The existing monumental building from 1922 was renovated and expanded within an annex incorporated in the landscape. The veteran offers shelter to those uh, um, companies, I guess, the neighborhood shop and the gym. The police co consultation hours take, uh, takes place here to, take place here too, no, or takes place here too. By using a building together, the different institutions can work together better and activities for neighborhood residents be matched. Uh, so it was an existing building here. In fact, it reminds one a little bit of uh, the architecture of Willem Dudok.
So this is uh, an intervention within uh, an existing uh, building, an, uh, an existing context. The hybridity that he serves through his architecture helps the cause of dialogue, of uh, transgressing frontiers. Despite the clarity of, uh, of geometry, Now we are, approach, uh, we are approaching the end of the presentation. There are just a few more images. This is a concert hall he built between 1992 and 1995 in Breda. It's this building here. A little different from the other buildings we saw by him. Um, he assumed even, uh, you know, curvatures, which didn't happen often in his architecture before. A concert concert hall. So maybe you know a reference to the fluidity of music. So again, this architect who employed geometry in very convincing and rigorous ways was not turning his back on what we call fluidity in this case. But even in the other cases that we saw, where there was a fluidity of space within um, you know rather well defined uh, framing uh, uh, through geometry Hermann Herzberger closer to our time as i said he is 91 years old today Okay, and uh, we, I have two more images, an extension of this theater when some new cinemas were added from 2016 to 2020. So this was three years ago. The Chasse, I don't know if I pronounce well, theater designed by architect Hermann Herzberger or architects AHH, his name and architecture will get extra cinemas. This in, they already got, the, the text was written before the, the building uh, happened. These cinemas will be added as new rounded volumes to the existing building, making them visible in the lobby. So very interesting, you know, these volumes were to be seen or were to be visible from the lobby. Again, in, the, in an attempt to break frontiers and create create communication between various parts uh, of the building. Both spaces will accommodate about 50 people, so they are small cinemas. To make the cinemas accessible, a new staircase, I, I could say, was added, which, will, uh, which would sing, uh, now I complicate myself, because the, the work was already done, you are going to see, which will swing, uh, swing to, through the foyer, the stairs not only serve to go quickly to the cinema spaces, but the visitor moves upwards together with the staircase and sees a spectacle unfolding below of the free form choir and the other visitors. Cinema visit becomes more than just watching a movie. It's also watching each other, seeing and being seen an evening out. And again, it's in, in the same attempt of serving the public dimension of architecture, serving uh, to reach that dialogue, that communication, that interaction between the members of society. And these are the interior spaces. And, and yes, you can tell that they are conducive to interaction, horizontally and vertically. So it's not just about placidly sitting in a chair and watching a movie but it's also about communicating with those who, who, 
came to the cinema with the same purpose, not only to watch a movie, but also to interact with the others. So indeed, the public dimension of architecture, Hermann Herzberger served consistently all his life. Thank you, and happy birthday, Hermann Herzberger. <laughs>